Since episode 9 of Our Flag Means Death aired on March 24th, 2022, the show has taken the world by storm. It's been called a mortal blow to queer baiting, and as dramatic as that sounds, I don't think it's an exaggeration. But by far one of the strangest compliments I've heard about Our Flag Means Death is that it's a story without homophobia. Not only do I believe this to be greatly bending the truth for new viewers, but I find the way it subtly examines and unravels centuries of queer societal abuse to be deeply, deeply powerful. A few years ago, my mom and I got really into watching old PSAs together from the 50s and 60s. A lot of them surprisingly had pretty sound and practical advice, but some, well, embodied exactly the ideals you'd expect. What Jimmy didn't know was that Ralph was sick, a sickness that was not visible like smallpox, but no less dangerous and contagious, a sickness of the mind. You see, Ralph was a homosexual, a person who demands an intimate relationship with members of their own sex. It's easy for me, a queer person born in 2002, to laugh at how stupid this is. But it didn't really viscerally hit me until I started thinking way too hard about our flag means death that real children were shown this in school. It's not just that straight kids were indoctrined into fearing us, gay kids were gaslit into fear and disgust for themselves. This rhetoric far from stops there. It permeates deeply in the history of cinema, allowing LGBT characters to only be represented as immoral and deserving of punishment in accordance with the Hayes Code. From here we see the advent of queer coding, a neutral term but definitely has sinister history. Queer coding in the old days of the Hayes Code was sometimes a genuine attempt at sneaking in representation, but most of the time, it was a wanted poster. Gay men are unholy and dangerous, so we need to watch out for them. And gay men are effeminate, cunning, and easily frightened. Our flag means death doesn't remove these stereotypes. It makes peace with them. Tell me you defile beautiful things isn't speaking directly to the entire generation of gay children forced to sit in school auditoriums and watch videos painting them as dangerous, gross, and corrupting. Chauncey, take it from a man with regrets. Think this through. Oh, shut up. All I've been doing is thinking and drinking, drinking and thinking. Do you know what conclusion I've reached? Turn around. Steve Bonnet is not a human. Just breathe. You're a monster. Plague. You defile beautiful things. My dear brother. Your own family. You've even managed to bring history's greatest pirate to ruin. And here you are, unscathed. God's perfect little rich boy. I think you're right. When Chauncey is drunkenly berating Steed, he lists Edward as the final nail in the coffin for why he deserves to die, why he's dangerous enough for his death to be a necessity. After all, he brought the world's greatest pirate to ruin. This, thankfully, because I'm terrible at these, is a perfect segue to Ed's relationship with queer identity. Well, it feels nice to tidy up a little. Can't believe I was living like this. Can you is? Is he? I'm gonna speak plainly. Wonderful. You know, we share our thoughts on this ship. I should have let the English kill you. This whatever it is that you've become is a fate worse than death. Well, I am still Blackbeard, so. No! This. This is Blackbeard. Not some namby-pamby in a silk gown pining for his boyfriend. Choose your next words wisely, dog. There he is. <laughs> Blackbeard is my captain. I serve Blackbeard. 
that we'd better watch this fucking step. I see this as a twin star of sorts to the Chauncey scene, because it too can't really be divorced from queer trauma. You cannot pretend this is not about Ed being openly gay when Izzy insults him in an incredibly pointed way and practically spits the word boyfriend. Yes, I know over half the ship is gay, fuck there's like a 90% chance Izzy himself is gay, but that doesn't suddenly make Namby Pamby in a silk dressing gown sound anything less than incredibly homophobic. Izzy is ruthlessly forcing Ed to doubt his decision to no longer perform Blackbeard, making him not only feel weak and pathetic, but unable to discern who his real enemies are. When his friends stomp on the deck and call for another song, it's recontextualized into a threat. Edward, better watch his step, is still ringing in his ear and mixing all too well with his friends' supportive shouts, reminding him how horrifyingly unsafe it is to be seen. Steed cannot hide, and he's forever punished for it. Edward can and he is stuck on that damn stage for the rest of his days or else. By episode 9, Ed is almost literally pleading to just be himself and for that to be okay. He's shouting that shit from the rooftops, he's holding it in a white knuckle grip in the first half of episode 10, and ultimately Ed's attempt not only brings him a danger he's never allowed himself to face and therefore can't handle, blame is also placed on Steed for making him this way. Bonnet done something to my boss's brain. You said when you made me first mate, above all else is loyalty to your captain. And I was never going to stand by and let you destroy yourself for that. Swat. You even managed to bring history's greatest pirate to ruin. Ed's love for Steed is frequently described in language that suggests impurity and even victimhood. He's seen as someone who's been compelled by Steed to go against his true nature. It's especially fascinating to note the time period in this instance. Gayness in the early 18th century was just barely starting to be considered an identity. It was still widely considered something you did rather than something you are. And if it was something you did, it could be done to someone else. It is actually pretty accurate Izzy's anger towards Ed's closeness to Steed mainly becomes explicit in instances where Ed blurs gender roles. And before we continue, I just want to clarify, I mean like real traditional shit. Stuff most of us now hopefully agree is stupid. But for a long time, much of the anxiety surrounding homosexuality came from the genuine fear that society would crumble if the line between men and women were blurred, especially as it pertained to labor. Oh no, he's folding things! Because of this, there's a long, ugly history of demonizing specifically effeminate gay men for either just existing or encouraging other men to go against their totally scientifically sound natures. Chauncey and Izzy show disdain for Steed because they believe he's responsible for Ed no longer acting like Blackbeard, like a real pirate, a real man. And Steed, having been shown time and time again he can never be worthwhile to anyone, takes the bait, hook, line, and sinker. But of course, he's wrong. Steed is effeminate, cunning, and easily frightened and he betters the lives of anyone willing to get close to the real him not despite these traits, but because of them. He encourages his crew to talk things through, share their feelings openly, and care for one another above violence for the sake of being real pirates. He didn't ruin Blackbeard, he saved Ed. Blackbeard was uncomfortable and unhappy, but now so much joy is brought to Ed's life that people are going around saying things like Taika Waititi invented eyes. The fears of homosexuality being something that'll inherently mix roles between men and women are incredibly trivial, and the pressure men feel to fit these roles could be literally killing them at times. Steed thinks that he pulled Ed away from what was pure and natural for him, but really he just gave him the freedom and confidence to express what's already there. He's folding stuff, and that's okay. I think it makes perfect sense Steed didn't understand his feelings for Ed as love and ran away. A classic facet of homophobia is the othering of gay love, seeing it as a cheap substitute or corruption of straight relationships. 
For years, relationships between men were othered, spoken of only in the language of criminology, a danger, something gone wrong. But our flag means death invokes these abuses while allowing Steed to overcome them, as he learns that what's happening between him and Ed is natural, benign, romantic. Not only is this shown beautifully and explicitly in the scene with Mary, but there are so many creative decisions that make it clear Our Flag Means Death is a love letter to queer audiences. This isn't just a show that has gay characters. Queer culture is woven into its very fabric. Things that are typically watered down into stereotypes but genuinely ring true as part of a rich and unique history. A wonderful example is the motif of performance. People didn't just pull the whole gay men love theater thing out of their asses. There was a time when most actors were viewed as undesirable anyway for being low-class wanderers. Giving us elusive freedom as its mantra quickly became, well, who am I to judge? No, you don't have to pretend. Mr. Holmes told us everything. About you and him. About me and him? Come on, we need to be bashful. We're not bourgeois. Maybe between doctors and detectives is unusual, but in ballet... It's very usual. What is it? Caprice of Mother Nature. Look at Pavel and Misha, Boris and Dimitri and Ilya and Sergei. And Sergei, half enough. Besides, it was actually legal and a whole lot safer than other jobs of similar appeal. Like, uh, oh, I don't know. Piracy. That was fucking amazing. Guys, the sheer level of talent we have on this ship. Why are we even being pirates? <laughs> Beyond the more practical origin of this stereotype, one of the biggest things that makes our oppression unique as a minority group is that we have the ability to hide. Our ability to perform literally all the time is our ticket to safety. A concept our flag means death depicts with all the trauma that affords. Lucius is another excellent example. Lucius is essentially the gay best friend trope we see flagrantly in the early 2000s, but instead of being an accessory to some random woke straight woman, he's actually allowed to be a part of his own community. He calls Ed out so fearlessly because he is in a position of authority when it comes to emotional perception and romantic relationships despite being much younger, which is a very queer-specific dynamic. Oftentimes, effeminate gay men either can't hide their queerness or just choose not to. Because of that, they're often seen protecting or mentoring newer members of our community, and that role is incredibly important and deserving of respect, which the narrative gives. Speaking of Lucius, he also brings up example three, which is beards. So many beards. <laughs> Even name-dropping fanfiction! It sounds silly, but that is a part of modern queer culture. It's our way of resisting erasure from the media we consume, and it's probably no coincidence we've seen a widespread disrespect of it only when the genre became dominated by queer writers for that purpose in recent history. Okay, I'll stop. Getting back on track, this is the difference between stereotyping and representation. It's not just slapping a trope up there as a substitute for actual personhood. It's portraying these characteristics earnestly and complexly, solely for the benefit of us seeing ourselves and knowing we deserved better all along. And it's not only telling Steed he should have his happiness, but showing us as a community that we should have ours, especially those who were cheated out of it when they were young. Blackbeard's main outfit is modeled directly after an 80s classic, but also doubles as a nod to a prominent gay subculture. All of the songs featured are from the late 70s. The character beats are something male Gen Xers can relate to, while the relationship beats almost have a teen movie vibe, with Jenkins specifically likening them to 16-year-olds in a recent interview. The show doesn't just have middle-aged characters by happenstance, it's intentionally made with older gay men in mind. People who spent their formative years during the AIDS crisis, and would have never seen themselves in those old pretty and pink style rom-coms when they were actually 16. All of this is to say that the narrative tells Chauncey to suck eggs in hell. Steed's love for Ed, his queerness, did not defile beautiful things. It is a beautiful thing. The show needed that scene to remind us of all the lies we were systematically told. And by fuck were they reconciled. <laughs>